Thank you very much. A lot of very young faces here. It's great. <laughs> Your Eminence, dear President Dr. O'Donnell, Mrs. O'Donnell, faculty, staff, dear students. What a pleasure and honor it is for me to be here tonight. It's an honor because you are part of an institution that contributes since 40 years to promote Catholic culture in the United States and even in the world. And it's also an honor because it is not every day that you are handed an, a microphone to speak to 500 students sitting in silence. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll take advantage of this. <laughs> and I'll try to do my best in the next 40 minutes. I would like to thank Dr. Donnell for the kind invitation to celebrate with you the 40th anniversary of Christendom. My wife, Kathleen, and I are very, very happy to be with you tonight. So I was introduced very kindly, thank you very much. Um, I'm the grandson of Archduke Karl Ludwig, who is one of the son of Blessed Karl and Servant of God, Sita. He's the fifth son. And uh, he's the only one who was born during the rule of my great grandfather. He was born in Vienna. And I'm the son of Archduke Karl Christian and Princess Maria Astrid of Luxembourg, who is the sister of the current Grand Duke of Luxembourg. And so, as you mentioned, we live in, in Geneva, Switzerland. And we have two little daughters, Maria Stella, four years old, and Magdalena, two years old, and I got the permission to announce to you that we have a third one on the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that's going to be for the fall. We still have a little bit of time. Um, so I will start with a little confession. A few years ago, in 2010, I was having a professional experience in Washington, D.C. with different political and economical organizations, and some friends of mine really advised me to come to visit Christendom College. So the schedule was a little bit busy, but I must say, as a European, I didn't really know where it was, and I didn't know much about the college. So they told me, oh, it's close to the Shenandoah River, and you can see the Blue Ridge Mountain, it's beautiful. I said, oh, that rings a bell. I know a song by John <laughs> Dever, <laughs> Country Roads. <laughs> and so the, deci the decision was made, and I came here by car, and it was beautiful. I didn't see much of the river. The mountains were not as high as in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> but the college was great. I love the campus, I love the spirit. Uh, in which you, you all study. But the crowning of this visit was uh, the visit with your founder, Dr. Warren Carroll, and his wife, who I'm very happy to see here tonight. And uh, I was at their home, and we had a very nice conversation. And at the end, they gave me a book called 1917. And it was exactly this book that they handed me and I was very impressed to see my great-grandfather on it. It was very, very moving. And you could tell that Dr. Carroll had a deep spirit and understanding of the gravity of the world and the desperate need to restore it in Christ. I highly recommend you this book. Probably you all read it already. <laughs> but if not, please read it, because it's, it's, it's really interesting. It describes very well the year 1917. That means 100 years ago. It mentions my great-grandfather that tried to achieve all he could to achieve peace among the nations during the First World War. It mentions the apparitions in Fatima that happened during May and October 1917. And the last apparition, as you know, um, happened two days before the Red Revolution occurred in Moscow, bringing communism for the next 70 years in many countries of Central Europe countries that are very linked to my family because they were part of the empire. So this introduction shows a bit the spirit in which I would like to now tell Blessed Carl's story and the messages that he has for today. Emperor Carl only ruled two years, 
from November 1916 to November 1918, in the middle of the First World War. There was, of course, very difficult moments, taking painful war decisions, secret negotiations treaties to achieve peace, which were destined to fail, the negotiations at the end of the war with the new council in Vienna that wanted him to abdicate and leave the country. And at the time, he was about my age. Karl was beatified in 2004 by Saint, by, by Saint Pope John Paul II, and all the members of my family were there to witness this important moment in Rome. In 2008, the process of beatification uh, started also for my great-grandmother that we saw before, and she has this beautiful title, Servant of God, which is a stage before the beatification. So we all hope that one day we might have, we might have a, a saintly couple. So let me give you a little bit of historical context. My wife always tells me that I have to be careful with this word because it sounds very boring, but I think it's important to have a little bit of context to understand how it was 100 years ago. Carl was born on August 17th, 1887. And as a Habsburg, he was a member of the imperial and royal family that was governing the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. The Habsburg family started their own story in Austria on the 13th century, in 1273, when Rudolf I was elected emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. You probably studied, studied this period with your history professors. The Holy Roman Empire has its origin with the coronation of Charles the Great, Carlos Magnus, uh, who was crowned by Leo III on December 25th of the year 800. The Holy Roman em Emperor was traditionally elected by the so-called prince electors. And as a matter of fact, the Habsburg family ruled with very little interruptions between the 13th century and 1807, when Franz II dissolved the Holy Roman Empire after the defeat of Austerlitz against Napoleon, because he feared that the Holy Roman Empire would be dissolved by him. So he founded the Austrian Empire to create a continuity, and this lasted till 1918, at the end of the First World War. So to give you a little idea how it was in 1914, this was the, the empire in, in Europe, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. On the north, you have Cisletania, which represented the northern and western territories. And then you had in green Translitania, which were the Hungarian lands linked to the crown of St. Stephen. You had 50 million people. It was the second most populous country or territory after France. It was the second biggest territory after Russia. 13 current European countries or part of them, 11 nationalities, 11 official languages, and all religions were represented. A historian once described the Austrian-Hungarian Empire as a European Union before its time. As you, can, as you can imagine, it was very hard to keep all the people united. It was very challenging. But it worked for a very long time, around six centuries, and mainly for two reasons. The first one is that despite a great cultural diversity, everybody could identify with the emperor, with the king. For example, my great-grandfather, Karl, was Karl I in Austria. He was Karl IV in Hungary, Karl III in Bohemia, and so on. So everybody could say, he is my king. And that helped to unite the people. The second point why it worked was decentralization of power and culture. It was recognized that in order to unite all the people, you had to apply the principle of subsidiarity. What is this? It meant that the upper level, the state level in Vienna, for example, would only perform tasks if the lower level in different regions could not perform it. So in politics, uh, you could translate it by inst in-store different uh, political parliaments in the different regions so that everybody could say a saying, everybody could have a saying. 
In culture, it meant the promotion of their own culture. Everybody had the freedom to speak their own languages, which was not always the case in surrounding countries. And of course, there was a freedom of religion. At his birth, Karl was a great-grandnephew of the Emperor Franz Josef, and only the seventh Archduke in line to the throne. So nobody really expected him to one day become emperor. Nobody but a nun, Mother Vincentia, who had the stigmata and was living in a monastery in Schopron in Hungary. And she one day said, when he was born, that the young Archduke Karl should be surrounded, wrapped in prayer, because one day he will become emperor and king, and he will experience great suffering and be the target of many evil attacks. That was at his birth. Blessed Karl had a normal youth, but of course was educated the way family members were educated. That means, among other things, that he was required to master multiple languages, French, Latin, German, Slovak, Czech, Hungarian to start, and then it will continue. <laughs> and of course, he, would, he needed to get familiar with geographical, political uh, realities of the regions and the countries of the empire. He also entered into the military, as you can see on the picture, and he was given more and more um, responsibilities very quickly. In 1911, Karl became engaged to Tzita, as you can see, she was princess of Bourbon Parma. My great grandmother would later recall that during the engagement, she went to Rome to have a private audience with the Pope, who was Pius X, who later became a saint. And the Pope, perhaps inspired by the Holy Spirit, told Sita the following, you will marry the heir to the throne, Karl, and I will give you all my benedictions. Austria will receive many graces thanks to him. Karl is the gift from God made to his peoples for all the good that the empire has done for the church for centuries. And Sita recalls also that apparently at that point she almost forgot the protocol and she was tempted to say, Your Holiness, Emperor Franz Josef is still quite healthy, the heir Franz Ferdinand is still very young, and if my my husband will rule, it will be no less than 30 years. But of course, she didn't say that, and in turn turned to her mother and said, thank God, mother, the Pope is not infallible in political matters. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, three years later, in 1914, uh, Crown Prince Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. You probably heard of it in your history courses. It was a little bit the trigger of the First World War. And it provoked a series of war declarations from all parts of European powers. It quickly led to what is known as the most terrific, cruel and bloody war, the First World War. And this event placed young Karl and Sita first in line to the throne. And two years later, in 1916, the Emperor Franz, Fed, uh, Franz Josef died after a reign of 68 years. Karl became, at age 29, the emperor and king of a vast empire engaged in a losing war. As a new monarch, he felt responsible for the well-being of his people. His first duty, his first mission, was to achieve peace among the nations. In fact, he is the only ruler who accepted the peace proposal of the Pope, Benedict XV at the time. But as he was the only one, the proposal could never be implemented. But he was known as the emperor of, of, of peace because of all his efforts. At the end of the war, US President Wilson, 14 points were implemented. And in essence, it meant the empire was to be dissolved as were the bonds among the different nationalities and peoples. Left piecemeal after the dissolution of the empire, Wilson's plan left those, those countries powerless to defend themselves from communism and fascism that was coming. And this chaos and power vacuum would cost millions of lives in the next 70 years. Karl was 31 at the time. 
he was pressured to abdicate, which he never did, and finally forced to leave the country in exile. He also never abdicated the Hungarian throne. He tried twice in dramatic attempts to return to Hungary to reclaim the throne because he felt very strongly that he was the rightful uh, king of Hungary. But the second time, accompanied by his wife, Zita, they were arrested by a man called Admiral Horthy, who was a man of trust of Karl. He even came to his wedding. And here you can see on the first picture above, I don't know, it's maybe a little bit uh, small, but you can see the coronation in Hungary in 1916 with the crown that belonged to St. Stephen in the year 1000. And for him, it was really like a sacrament. And on the second picture, you see a mass that they were attending, and you see the train going to Budapest. And this was the second attempt to uh, regain the throne. It failed because some, uh, a, a, a little milice uh, organized by Admiral Horthy came and started shooting on the train. And he didn't want any bloodshed for him. So he asked the train to go back, and then he was arrested. So it's a very moving picture because this was just a couple of hours before he was arrested. And you see them kneeling. So um, wait. <laughs> so the family was, was exiled after he got arrested and sent by boat on the faraway island of Madeira, far away from Portugal. And while still on the boat, Carl admired a church on the top of the hill, and that was to be his last home when he died five, month la five months later on April 1st, 1922. He died from a pneumonia at age 34 in extreme poverty and great suffering. And nobody, and his body is still there in this church, far away from the family and the people he loved. So you can see that in the eyes of the, of, the, of the world, it seemed like a big failure. But we will see that in the eyes of the church, the church sees it a little bit differently. So let's look a little bit more into why Blessed Karl and son, son of, Servant of God, Sita, were chosen by the church, among other saints, to serve as examples. We could look at their lives on the basis of two dimensions. Their family life as husband and wife, father and mother of eight children, and the professional life of Karl and Sita, head of state, head of the armies, men of huge responsibilities. But these two dimensions would lose their whole relevance and significance if we wouldn't mention a third dimension that is transcending the two others, their spiritual life as people of God, people of prayer. Karl and Sita became engaged, then married, in 1911, and just before their wedding, they placed their marriage under the protection of the Virgin Mary. They were profoundly religious, and Karl and Sita educated their children the Catholic way. They always used to say prayers for meals and every night, so they were very, very pious, and they tried to really uh, give this faith to the children. They also set an example of a joyful couple in front of the children, even in very hard moments. Some of the older aunts and uncles recalled the time in Madeira in exile. And they said that they didn't remember they were poor. They didn't know they were poor. But they were constantly hungry, and they were cold. Apparently, the water was oozing from the walls, and the bed sheets were always wet and cold. And these are very concrete things that a child remembers. But nevertheless, the emperor used to say, we are undeservedly well, and we are grateful for the generosity of the people here. Empress Sita also, throughout her long life, was never nostalgic and told everyone in the family never to be bitter about the situation. God has a plan, and the plan is perfect. The church decided to establish Karl's feast day on October 21st. And this is not a mere coincidence. It is not the death day. It is not the birthday. It is their wedding day. And I think John Paul II clearly understood 
that Blessed Carl and, son of, and Servant of God Sita together had a strong message to, to deliver on how to live a fruitful and virtuous marriage. So probably most of you are not married yet. Maybe some of you are thinking of it, and maybe some of you not at all. <laughs> I will leave it for later. But one thing is sure is that you're living some very important uh, years of your life. Why? Because if you put things into perspective, you will very, very quickly come to some questions. Why am I here on earth? What is, the, what is the real purpose of my life here? What was I made for? And as Catholic, we have this enormous gift to know what the purpose is. The church gives us a clear answer. It is to live our lives in order to one day get to heaven and be united to God, to Jesus. And how do we get to heaven? How do we advance? I should let the Cardinal speak, but I will try. <laughs> we advance through living out our vocation. And this is why Blessed Carl told his wife this very important phrase right after his wedding. And he said, now we have to help each other to get to heaven. It's a powerful phrase that shows that he understood that his marriage was a path to achieve the purpose of his life, get to heaven. So for you, when you discern your vocation, and it starts now, married life, consecrated life, religious life, think that this is a gift that God gives you to achieve your life purpose. If it's married life, we need to discern very well the person you will spend your life with. It will be your vocation to holiness. But if you put things into perspectives, you will always make the right choices. I was personally very scared about not finding the right person. And I remember making this commitment at some point to pray every day for my vocation. And if my vocation was married life, then to pray for my future wife. And I also remember doing a, a pilgrimage in Lourdes, France. Maybe some of you went there. And I did a pilgrimage with my brother. And I remember praying intensively to find a wife. I said, I need a wife soon. <laughs> so, and that was September 2010. A month later, <laughs> a month later, I came to your great country. And it is in Washington, DC, that I met Kathleen, my wife, at the mass in honor of Blessed Carl. On October 21st, his feast day, which, as I mentioned, is also their wedding day. So this was for me a beautiful present from heaven. It showed that God takes care of us. He listens to our prayers. And of course, it was a proof that my great-grandparents were very active from above. <laughs> <laughs> so a great European personality once, say, once said, the difference between a politician and a statesman is that a politician thinks about the next election and the statesman think about the next generation. Blessed Karl was a true statesman as he understood that his position is essentially a position of service, regardless if it does serve his own interest or not. As soon as he became emperor, he engaged in endless peace negotiations with Great Britain, with France, through the brothers of Tita, who had close relations with those countries. But none of them succeeded because neither the French nor the British government wanted peace until the enemy was defeated. Nevertheless, he never gave up hope and kept on doing everything he could to serve the common good and the welfare of his people. For example, he forbid systematic bombing of cities, the use of gas. He ordered not to condemn prisoners whenever possible. He refused the bombing of Venice. Karl was also the first world leader to establish a ministry of social welfare commissioned to, to deal with youth, youth issues, widows, orphans, unemployment, and so on. This was quite unusual at the time. Blessed Karl had a merciful heart. Being constantly on the front during the war, he one day met a crying woman who told him that she lost her husband, 
she lost two of her three sons, and she didn't know where the, th the third son was. When he heard this, he told someone to go and find the third son and send him home as soon as possible. We lack time today, but there are hundreds of, story of stories like this in the archives in Rome that show that he was really a person with a great heart. He was an emperor and a king, but he was also a man of God. Emperor Karl considered his position as a commission from God. It didn't mean the unlimited right to power. It meant the absolute duty to follow and imitate the example of Jesus Christ. The coronation of Hungary, we saw the pictures, is a wonderful example. Karl was made king and the bishop anointed him with sacred oil. And this was for him like a sacrament. One day, during the war, Karl and Sita were visiting a city in Hungary. And the people along the road were cheering him, a little bit like on this picture. And they were throwing flower petals on his way. And Sita told Karl, because she knew that he had a lot of concern, and she told him, you see how the people love you. They know that you care about them. They know that you're doing everything you can to help them. And he smiled and acknowledged it. But he also said that after Jesus was welcomed with such enthusiasm in Jerusalem, he suffered his sorrowful passion. Karl didn't compare himself to Jesus, but he knew that very difficult times were about to come. Another time, Blessed Karl said to Tzita privately and with humility, and this is what makes him also a saint. I strive always and in all things to understand as clearly as possible and follow the will of God. Later in Madeira, as he was praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, he felt very clearly that God was asking of him the ultimate sacrifice, his life. And he was very conscious of it, and he talked to Tzita about it, and together they said yes. She was pregnant of their eighth child. He became sick shortly after and started to suffer extremely. No doctor was granted the permit to come to the island, but my great-grandfather never lost sight of the cross. And he said, I have to suffer so much so that one day my peoples can come back together again. After expressing his profound wish to go home to his homeland in Austria, he said to Zita, I love you so much, and then prayed for all the children one by one, including the unborn one. He then died pronouncing several times the name of Jesus. At the time, Sita was only 29 years old. She gave birth to their daughter, Elizabeth, soon after Carl's death. She and the children took refuge first in Spain and then to Belgium, the only country that granted them official papers and also a good education for the children. Sita was a very pious person, praying constantly and she was very close to all her grandchildren. Since the death of her husband, she never stopped wearing black as a sign of devotion to him and to his sufferings. After more than 60 years in exile, she finally was granted by the Austrian state to come back to Austria and to meet with the whole population. She died a couple, she died a couple of, day of years later in 1989 at the age of 96 in Switzerland in a convent. So from a human perspective, when we assess their lives, it seems that a lot of things went terribly wrong. But the church wants to show us that whether or not a life succeeds before God does not depend on earthly success. To conclude, let me finish by drawing a little parallel between the events 100 years ago and now. We've seen that Blessed Karl did try everything he could to achieve peace among the nations during the war. And we've also seen that nobody wanted to make peace until the enemy was defeated. And this is true, of course. 
But there is another, less official reason. Some of the top official people at the time could not wait for a better occasion to finally, to finally destroy what was known as the last Catholic bloc and dynasty. I think we can say it, the purpose was to destroy an order that was so closely linked to Christendom. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire, a direct inheritance of the Holy Roman Empire, was working hand in hand with the church to promote and defend Christianity. A Christian society aims at, aims at protecting life from conception to natural death. It seeks to protect the weakest among us. It's a society where the family is portrayed as the key to a stable and healthy society. It is a state in which the government works hard to promote peace, to promote peace and the well-being and the common good of the people. 100 years later, where do we stand? I'm not sure we can say that we made a lot of progress in those areas. And there are several reasons for that, of course. Individualism, uh, materialism, egoism, etc. But it all comes down to one simple observation. We've been ignoring God's presence in this world. We've been rejecting the teaching of the church and we have been denying our Christian roots and the Christian heritage. As an example, in 2001, the European Union wanted to have their own European constitution. And of course, in the very first articles of the draft constitution, they started to think about, should we mention God in the articles? Should we mention our Christian roots, our Christian values? And they commissioned a whole Congress, the Congress of Laken in Belgium. And after huge debates, they decided to suppress the mention of God and the mention of Christian values and Christian roots. And the actual phrase states in, Arcti in Article 1A of the Lisbon Treaty, which is a little bit like the Constitution, it states, the union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for the human rights, including the rights of the persons belonging to minorities. So these are all very good values. I'm totally for it. But these are civic values. They're not cultural values, and they're not spiritual values. And why do I tell you this? It's because if we ignore or worse, if we reject where we come from, how can we know where we're going to? Because we don't know where we are. Or worse, we don't know who we are. It's like cutting the roots of a tree. After the First World War, politicians, but no doubt everyone at the time, were all asking the same questions. What order do we want? What do we want to achieve? Where do we want to go? And today, probably Europe seems to be asking the same old questions. We're facing a serious identity crisis. And if greater confusion comes in the near future, what kind of ideologies will flourish? And what kind of ideologies will fill in this vacuum we have? Will it be Islam? Will it be extreme secularism, where the religion comes from the state? Will it be relativism, where nobody knows what is, tr what is wrong and what is good? Or Will it be our Christian values, our Catholic values, and our faith? I think it is our responsibility, our mission to all of us, to propose our faith and the intellectual heritage as a foundation to healthy society, respecting the dignity of all. And the youth has a major role to play, you in particular. It is a time where you learn a lot. You are giving a wonderful education thanks to your professors, thanks to this institution that gives you a strong and rigorous education, uh, teach you how to develop critical thinking, how to discern the truth, how to act in a responsible way. And as I looked over your website a couple of days ago, I love the phrase of Pope Benedict XVI. He said, the world offers you comfort, but you were not made for comfort, you were made for greatness. And it is, in fact, great to be able to protect and promote the principles we believe in. As Catholics, we need to be in the world, but not from the world.
Let's seek the truth, look for beauty, and, and propose the good. For this, you need, of course, the intelligence, not only of mind, but of heart. And Blessed Carl's message is a message of hope, first of all, because there are wonderful things happening as well. We see full of great initiatives happening in Europe, and this is a great joy. And when everything seems dark, the Lord is still present and has everything in control. He can turn evil situation into a greater good. And as Catholics, we have a duty, just as Blessed Carl showed us, not to remain passive, but to do all we can to work for the common good, to love God and love our neighbor. It is our goal, it is your mission, it is our mission to be Christian lights of the world like the Pope proposes us and like you say, dare to be great. I think this is very important. Let me finish with a short prayer. May God, through the intercession of Blessed Karl of Austria, bless Christendom College, those responsible for its management, the faculty, the staff, and the many students. May they all receive the strength and necessary courage to always seek the will of God in all times and in all things. And please keep Europe and all these countries in your heart and in your prayers. Thank you very much.